coming up next on Legislative Review. The Growth Management Act may add a climate change policy. Compact communities consistently outperform more sprawling communities on greenhouse gas emission measures. If actually holding the people accountable that are doing the crimes to begin with might be reasonable as far as taking steps to reduce these mass shootings. Assault weapons points to a testy hearing in the House. Accountability is an important part of, of public safety, but the accountability happens after the incident. And what we're hoping for is to give people who are involved in those incidents a chance to survive them. The tribe's interest is basically never brought into consideration. And water policy for native tribes is heard in the Senate. Hello, I'm Troy Kirby with Legislative Review for January 21st, covering the 2020 legislative session. Today's episode looks at the Growth Management Act's climate change policy, assault weapons bans, and native tribe water policies. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name the is The Senate David Local Senator Government Mr. Committee Mr. held a public Mr. hearing on Senate Bills 6335 and 6453 on January 21st, which would add a climate change requirement to the Growth Management Act. The Association of Washington Cities was concerned about the feasibility of the policy. Uh, we think that uh, the elements bill has some specific concerns in terms of the expectation that specific actions will reduce, um, affirmatively reduce VMT and GHD reductions, how you would establish that for any particular local government decision. On the goal bill, same concerns in terms of um, having a goal that says we have to ensure those outcomes and whether that's feasible. The Department of Commerce felt that the policy would help meet state benchmarks towards climate change reduction. There's ways to get more than one benefit out of this. And a lot of the things you can do for climate change, um, relating around um, creating more compact communities uh, gets you a lot of different benefits. Compact communities consistently outperform more sprawling communities on greenhouse gas emission measures. And they also do that on, on multiple other uh, other ranges as well. So I think this is the mo one of the most effective strategies Washington can take to meet the climate change goals. Lawmakers were concerned about the potential fallout for smaller cities in Washington state. And I appreciate that you talk about um, the ability of any, any kind of element like this being able to be flexibly tailored to the community. Uh -huh. But is there language in the bill right now that protects that so groups can't come in and litigate and try to make it a one-size-fits-all? Well, if, I, uh, if, if I'm correct, the bill require, creates a framework where we sort of have to go through the process of allocating targets among the jurisdictions and among the regional transportation planning organizations. And then a local government would have to look at the targets, look at the, the, the landscape in their community, and um, they would have to develop a uniquely tailored plan to address that. Not, not every community is gonna have the same capacity uh, to address uh, that. That's one of the, that's one of the things that the, the, the target allocation process would have to go through. For agriculture, especially uh, those in, in the basin, the Columbia Basin, miles traveled. I don't know how in the world you would um, apply and actually succeed in reducing miles driven and maintain the economic viability of our farms. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna call the Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee uh, to order. Here the House Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee held a January 21st public hearing on several firearms bills. House Bill 2240 would ban the high capacity magazines of over 10 rounds. House Bill 2241 would ban the sale or ownership of assault weapons. Representative Brad Clippert questioned the vague descriptions of banned weapons defined in 2241. When you're defining a copycat weapon, it talks about folding telescopic stock, folding stock, or a telescoping stock. It talks about the pistol grip, and then uh, and the further definition talks about detachable magazine for a definition associated with an assault weapon. I'm not understanding what a pistol grip and a stock and or the fact that as a detachable magazine, if it has less than 10 rounds, why that would make it an assault weapon. The bill's sponsor framed it as a method to protect law enforcement. We're always concerned with making sure that our first responders are safe. And we know that every day they put their lives on the line. 
So the statistic that really stood out for me that of, of the approximately, and I don't have the specific numbers in front of me, but of, about of the, the approximately 100 law enforcement officers that have sacri made the ultimate sacrifice for their lives, about a quarter of those were killed by assault weapons. The 20, 23, I believe, first responders have been killed by assault weapons. Six of those, those assault weapons actually, the bullets actually penetrated their ballistic vests. That does not happen without this kind of firepower. 2241 is based off of Maryland gun laws, which was scrutinized for their effectiveness in stopping mass shootings. Mr. Thomas, you said that our, uh, these laws that we are proposing are based off Maryland's laws. I heard you make that statement. Are you aware that I heard first on the radio and then I had it confirmed by a researcher that Maryland's uh, death by firearm went up 30%, up 30% after they passed their highly restrictive weapons laws? When referring to why we based the laws off of uh, Maryland, we are specifically focusing on the constitutionality challenge to the, both the identification of specific firearms and their features. If actually holding the people accountable that are doing the crimes to begin with might be reasonable as far as taking steps to reduce these mass shootings. Accountability is an important part of, of public safety but the accountability happens after the incident. And what we're hoping for is to give people who are involved in those incidents a chance to survive them. Three other firearm bills were put before the committee concerning local government authority of regulation of guns, concealed weapons training, and public safety measures when a gun owner has been deemed a danger to themselves and others. Why can't I, as a Washington resident, feel safe when I am in a public place with one or more of the 6,000 Washingtonians that could be carrying a concealed lethal weapon with little or no training experience? This bill places an undue financial and physical restraint on our, the members of the LGBT community. One thing that's not mentioned in this bill, in order to do live fire training, you have to have a facility nearby. In Seattle, in the Capitol Hill District, you are 10 miles away from any range that allows you to be able to do any form of live fire training. Any individual without their own vehicle for transportation is prohibited upon Washington state law from being able to carry their firearm on mass transit. You must have a CPL in order to carry a firearm on mass transit. Chair Van Wagen, committee members. Uh, Surface water rights and native tribal water policy were discussed in the Senate Agriculture, Water, Natural Resources, and Parks Committee on January 21st. Senate Bill 6292 concerns water rights sales, prohibiting the Department of Ecology from water banking for third party means. Senator Jesse Solomon, the bill's sponsor, focused on an October 17, 2019 Seattle Times article, which focused on Wall Street's investments in water rights on farms along the Columbia River. My intention here, and I know it's, I tried to carefully construct the language, my intention is to prevent non-user third-party brokers, read Wall Street, from using a, a, a state-created, public-interest-oriented water bank for their own private uh, pecuniary s purposes. Both the Sierra Club and Building Industry of Washington were in opposition to the bill's language, but in favor of its intention. We are very concerned about um, barring particular individuals or organizations from transferring water into a water bank just because they haven't used it. I think it does kind of run into a little bit of a, a, a constitutional problem. I understand what the point is, but yet again, I would like to say that um, in order to, <laughs> I'm, you're going to hear this like four times today, but uh, in order to reduce the speculation in water, which it's not the best investment, quite frankly, because um, it's not proven to be a long-term good thing in every basin that um, uh, organizations or people have done it in. But in order to do this, you really do need to find a way that ecology can process water permits so it's not such a temptation because the water supply is so s s diminished and small that you know it's worth so much more in order to do this. So I do think this is a good conversation. I think we can come up with a solution if you sit a bunch of us in a room and we can um, duke it out. It's just probably uh, these bills are um, 
feel a little bit like a sledgehammer when they don't need to be. This is a threat to agricultural water, to municipal water, to in-stream flows. It's something we should be able to work on together, and I hope we can. I, I think it may take a little longer. We probably have some different ideas about how to approach the problem, but it is an important uh, issue we need to tackle. Also discussed was Senate Bill 6260, which focused on native tribal water policy. The reason I brought this bill forward is that uh, the public interest um, bothered me because the tribe's interest is basically never brought into consideration. And by the time a tribe finds out about a water right transfer or selling or whatever, um, they have to go to court. I really struggled about what to say about this bill because I do respect what uh, Senator McCoy um, says, and I I think that um, you know we would all be uh, wise to uh, kind of reflect on on some of his comments. But this does uh, clearly reflect a huge change in water law, and our concern is that it would create confusion, litigation, and unfortunately, I don't think a lot of resolution. Thank you for watching Legislative Review for January 21st, covering the 2020 legislative session. Follow us digitally on Facebook and Twitter, or watch Legislative Review on TVW Nightly at 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. with the Weekend Review Show on Friday and the weekend. I'm your host, Troy Kirby.